All right. Welcome, everyone. Hello. Uh, welcome to our Friday Digest series. Thank you for joining us. I'm Rebecca Rear, Director of Climate Policy and Justice here at Maryland LCV. If you've joined us before, you know our goal with these Friday Digests is to provide you with information, tools, and resources to be an informed and active advocate. Being with us for our weekly digests speaks to the power of our community and to your commitment to the solutions that will create a healthy environment for everyone in Maryland. We always want the agenda for these virtual meetings to be driven by your interests and needs, so please let us know what you want to hear. The easiest way to provide the information is to fill out the survey at the end of the session. So make sure you're monitoring the chat for that link. And as you join, please type your name into the chat and tell us where you're joining from. As we move through the half an hour we have together today, please type your questions and comments into the Q&A or the chat box and we'll get to as many as we can. Today's session is around energy efficiency and the EMPOWER program in Maryland. Since it kicked off in 2008, Maryland's Empower program has saved Marylanders $12.7 billion on energy bills and reduced Maryland's greenhouse gas emissions by 9.6 million metric tons of carbon dioxide, which, if that number doesn't mean anything to you, it's equivalent to taking 2 million cars off the road a year. That's a little bit easier to understand and pretty significant. The Empower program offers support for energy efficiency, through home audits, weatherization, and efficient appliances. Over the past few years, opportunities for improving the EMPOWER program have been identified, including aligning with the way the program metrics are measured uh, to line up with the state's greenhouse gas emission reduction goals, and how it can more effectively deliver benefits to low-income Marylanders. Proposals in legislation this year aim to enhance the effectiveness of the EMPOWER program by setting explicit greenhouse gas goals, enabling electric technology incentives, and ensuring funds are used directly for, cons con uh, for consumer residences and businesses for long-term sustainable electrification benefits. So today, we're joined by three very hardworking folks who can tell us more about Empower and what's on the table this session. So please join me in welcoming Ruth Ann Norton, President and CEO of the Green and Healthy Homes Initiatives. Hi, Ruth Ann. Okay, glad to be here. Thank you for having me. And Emily Scar, State Director at Maryland Perg. Hi, Emily. Hi. And Maddie Smith, Advocacy and Solar Congregations Coordinator at Interfaith Power and Light DMV. Hi, Maddie. All right, Ruth Ann, let's start with you. Tell us more about the Empower program. What is it? What are the benefits? And who is eligible to participate? Well, I'm going to let Emily give you the full tilt on the Empower program, but the Empower program for our work at the Great and Healthy Homes Initiative, taking the utility dollars uh, through the Public Service Commission and uh, and uh, working with DHCV and MEA, right? It, uh, it empowers an opportunity for low-income families in historically disinvested communities throughout our state to literally be healthier to have better health, economic, and social outcomes because we are taking them out of the dangers of extreme heat, uh, which is an increasing danger to health, morbidity, and mortality. And we are also addressing the issues of extreme cold. And those issues are critically important to us when we think about the whole house health, right? When we're looking holistically at how are we really getting outcomes. So by using empowered dollars, right, that we so need to get in line with our Climate Solutions Now goals and with the climate commitments made by Westmore at the U.S. Climate Alliance. We need this bill, right, because we need to deliver effectively and efficiently these dollars in alignment with health and safety. It literally is the difference between whether a kid will be in the hospital uh, for asthma in the emergency room or hospitalization versus being in the classroom. You know, we started our work looking at lead and that impact on learning and classroom ability. The impact of asthma, it's the number one reason kids don't get to school. It's also the number one reason for low income communities why people miss work is because of their children's asthma. But asthma, indoor air quality, heat and cold don't only affect our kids, affect our seniors, right? Recently, people may have seen the article 
in the Maryland Matters around Corliss Phillips, a retired uh, individual who had worked her entire career for the state and didn't have enough money to make her house safe enough to be able to have her grandson visit. It was empower dollars. It was the, the, the investments made, right, in weatherization, in energy efficiency that allowed us to reduce the asthmogens, address the lead paint issues, right? Because when houses expand and contract, it causes paint to chip, it brings mold, mildew, and moisture, it brings indoor air quality problems. So when we think about all of the wonderful technical pieces of Empower that Emily and Maddie will talk about, right? We are really interested in how do we smartly invest those dollars in alignment with coming rebates and tax credits and other dollars. But the linchpin is Empower. The linchpin to all of this is Empower. It's why we have to be activated now. We have to be electrified by the moment, right? To get the legislature to adopt the bill this year. They passed last year to get technical matters, right? In alignment. We have a new PSC. We have the, the leadership of the Moore administration. And we need this bill literally to empower our future and what we're doing. Um, and we you know, have to think about this, not only in the health is, uh, issues, but the economic issues and the reality of starting to benchmark at greenhouse gas emissions, right? And modernize our statute. So, you know, I'll let all of the deep experts talk about the wonky how-tos, right? But we need to keep also this in mind. We cannot effectively, by negligence or failure to adopt bills or failure to advance programs, literally leave low income communities holding the bag with uh, gas infrastructure and other things that in the future we know are gonna be obsolete. And people talk about people being left on a gas island I worry that we not make the mistakes of the past to not pay attention to where we ought to be investing first, to bring people to a quality standard of living and care for our environment. And by doing that, we will care for people's economic health, their actual health and true equity in this measure. So. I, you know, I just, uh, I'm fired up about this. Sorry, Rebecca, you know, I'm not a passionate person. So I'll let it be no, at that. No, Ruth, and that's why we started with you. And I so appreciate your framing around the, the whole home approach and really teeing up Empower as smart investment and as a health and all policies approach that when we invest in where people live and the health of that home and the health of the indoor air quality, through efficiency measures and through these investments, I mean, we're these are the kinds of policies that become win-win-win policies because we're addressing greenhouse gas emissions by reducing energy demand. We're taking, you know, hopefully taking people off gas uh, so that we're talking about, you know, electrification, um, which all improves health outcomes. And so these are the types of investments. That's why we want people to understand what this program is um, and so, so, so that when we're talking, when we're about to get into the changes that need to be made to the program, we can understand sort of why we need to align um, and how important Empower has been in this whole home approach. I'm going to be very brief, but just to say, right, if we want to be tangible about equity, mm -hmm. we have to pass Empower, right? And if we want to be serious about health, if we're thinking about that decarbonization to full electrification, I just want you to know really quickly what we know because we run a whole house program that electrifies right decarbonates and electrifies people's real estate values will go up because we are bringing them up to code to modernize electrification standards what we know from the houses that we have done this in our lowest income communities in baltimore their energy costs are actually down and health is improved so we, by doing this, we literally are going to move tangibly and transformationally on equity and health equity and moving from disparities to equity. I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Ruthann. 
Maddie, I'm going to kick it over to you and, and ask what's on the table. So we've talked about how great this program is and sort of the potential and um, uh, what it's doing well. So why do we have a bill? What do we need to change? What are what are we looking to improve within the Empower program? What's on the table uh, in 2024? Yeah, thanks, Rebecca, and thanks, Ruthanne. Um, I'm Maddie. My pronouns are they, them, um, and my organization, Interfaith Power and Light, we focus particularly on organizing the region's congregations and faith communities to form a religious response to climate change. Um, and Empower is at the top of our legislative priorities this year in Maryland, specifically because so many faith communities, you know, come to us asking about these issues and wanting um you know wanting to be able to help help folks like Ruth Ann was was talking about um so specifically so this bill that we're talking about to strengthen empower did pass um the house last year um sort of got stalled in the senate i'll let emily share more about that um and so where we're at this year is we have the same bill introduced with a lot of um, conversations in the off season about how we can make this happen this year. Specifically, some of our um, priorities that we wanna see in the bill this year include um, this question of fuel switching, which I know is really important to folks um, in this. So currently in power and Senate, like if folks can get um, rebates for switching to more efficient gas furnaces um, in their homes with the, the way the current Empower program is set up. And we really want to see, we need to make sure that the Empower program is aligned with the state's climate goals um, and to really make it possible for folks of all, all incomes, not just folks who can afford the 30% tax credit for heat pumps, um, to make it so that you know, we can we can get really efficient electric heat pumps in folks in people's homes. Um, there's also some pollution reduction targets that we're hoping will be in this new bill. Um, and that kind of goes along with the, the fuel switching. Like if you make the pollution reduction targets for this program really strong, then that just just shows that we like we have to do fuel switching to be able to do that. Um, we also want to make it so that, you know, right now, low-income Marylanders are paying more into the Empower program than they're getting back. Um, and so that's a really big e equity issue um, that we're concerned about um, because everyone that pays, you know, an energy bill um, pays into the Empower program. And then there's also um, an issue of how the, the state's utilities are allowed to, um, like how much money are they allowed to make off of Empower? Um, and currently, you know, they're similar. I think, I can't remember the exact percentages. Emily probably has this on the top of her mind and can share, but there's um, the amount of, you know, profits that Maryland's, um, some of Maryland's utilities make off of, you know, the costs that they're putting into Empower is a lot more than what utilities are making in other states. Um, and we just believe those funds would be better better used to, to actually help Marylanders. Um, yeah, and so where we're at, so the bill right now that was introduced in the House, there wasn't a bill introduced in the Senate, unfortunately. Um, but the House, you know, passed this bill last year. Um, and so we're, we're expecting them to do the same. But there is this question of amendments that need to be added that include some of these um, priorities. Um, yeah, and that's probably a good, good point to hand it off to Emily to talk about the feasibility of all of that. Yeah, fantastic, Maddie. Thanks. And, uh, you know, just to remind folks, the key points you mentioned right at the top, the fuel switching, the... Uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, targets as part of Empower, that is in Maryland's state climate pollution reduction plan as a legislative need. Um, page 90 might be my favorite page of that plan. Among several good things in that plan, page 90 actually outlines uh, legislative priorities that need that we need to see pass in order to realize the goals set out in our um, pollution reduction plan. And this is one of them. So it's a it's a critical issue um, at the environmental community summit. 
uh, which happened on January 31st. We uh, were joined by members of the administration who expressed support um, for the Empower legislation this year. So um, we did hear there's a House bill. Um, we're past the point in session where there was the deadline to drop in the Senate. Um, but that uh, so we're going to focus on the House and, and get what we need to get done there to send a strong bill over to the Senate. And with that, uh, it's a good time, like you said, to hand it over to Emily and ask. So we heard, we've heard about the good things the program does, the good things that are in the bill. What what are the opponents? like? Who, 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 who what, what hurdles are we facing here in 2024? Um, and, and what can folks do to sort of, to sort of get ahead of that? Like I say, during a hearing, they have proponents go first. Um, and it's not a rebuttal, but it's the art of the pre-buttal. So what are we, how are we pre-butting any uh, uh, arguments that we're going to hear from the other side here? Yeah, I don't, the good news is I don't think there's a tremendous amount of opposition. There's certainly some that I can touch on. And I'd say we feel very confident, you know, glad to have the administration support part of the climate package. The House has made clear they're ready to do this because they've already passed the bill. The Senate has also made clear that this is a priority with working with the agencies on technical fixes. And we know that those conversations are happening all the way up to the top. So we are uh, optimistic and you know glad that Empower is having those changes. And a lot of the challenges just really sometimes public policy is technical and challenging. Um, obviously, those of us who are around during the Climate Solutions Now Act remember how you know getting the details right was a challenge. And that is a challenge now, too. That we're made, what we're trying to do in principle is very simple. We are shifting Empower Maryland from a you know electrical savings goal to a greenhouse gas goal to make sure we're reducing pollution and aligning with our climate goals. But that simple decision has a cascade of technical fixes that we're not going to waste any time on today. But to make sure, what's the goal? Is it appropriate? Is it aggressive enough? Is it the right balance? What other safeguards do we need to make sure that even though we're switching to a climate goal, we're still prioritizing those real in-home benefits that Ruth Ann talked about are so important. Weatherization, energy efficiency audits, better windows that aren't just about purely electric energy as not as opposed to gas energy. So that's to say, it's just sort of complicated, even though the principle is simple. And that's one of the things that is slowing us down. And we want to make sure we keep our eyes on the prize. Um, I'd say the biggest opposition would be from the, some of the utility companies. Um, one of the things advocates have been pushing for, I know Maddie and Ruthanne mentioned this, is stopping incentives for gas equipment. Uh, electric heat pumps are vastly more efficient than traditional HVAC air conditioning or gas furnaces. So there's just simply no reason that we should be providing incentives for gas furnaces anymore. Right now I have a really old furnace. I could replace it with a furnace, but better if I replaced it with electric. So. Um, six to one, half dozen the other, way better for us to be in, in putting all of that money um, towards electric heat, uh, heat pumps than giving subsidies to gas. That's something we know the gas utilities aren't crazy about. They want to keep people using the gas system as long as possible, either as their primary heat source or now they're saying as a backup heat source. So we're going to be pushing hard to try to get them to, to disallow incentives for gas um, equipment and then power. Um, making that clear to your legislators would be helpful. The House actually left, didn't do this last year in their bill. Um, you think the program is still good, even if they don't make that final step, but we definitely want them to stop those subsidies, not use, not a useful use of ratepayer dollars. And the second thing that we expect opposition on is around the utilities profits. As Maddie said, the way that the Empower had, Empower has been financed in a number of different ways in the last 15 years. <laughs> Most recently, the way it's been financed has enabled the, the utilities to make some pretty loud profits, large, large and loud, 15 to 20 percent um, on the program, which is shockingly high. If that doesn't sound shocking to you, it is. You know, they make about 9 percent profit on the uh, for just the delivery of energy to your home. And on average, some of the best performing states get about 5% return on their energy efficiency program. So there was an attempt in the House last year to lower that rate of return. And there's sort of an open question on if we're, we're not giving them that profit anymore, what should we have a profit scenario going forward? Should we have incentives for them to hit their goals, penalties for them not hit their goals? We don't have to. I think it's worth having a discussion when Empower first launched um, in their late 20, 2008, 2009, 
Maryland Perk did like a series of reports. The utilities aren't hitting their goals. The utilities aren't hitting their goals. The utilities aren't hitting their goals. So I get why we might, the PSC might want to consider um, a prof, profit program or an incentive program. They put in, they actually asked the utilities to make proposals for this um, when they put in their empower fi filings in 2023. Uh, the PSC didn't like what they saw, said they still need work. Um, we'll have a conversation about it, even maybe have a task force or a committee. Mm -hmm. But the existing profit model, it's going to take about five years to pay, you know, for for the existing financing structure to shift. So they will be already making some profits for the near future. So we have time to figure out what's an alternative incentive system um, to provide for the utilities. And the PSC should look at that. We'd be nervous um, of any attempt to sort of shortcut that system and legislate some incentive model this year. Um, and we, we suspect that something that utilities are pushing for, we'll, we'll learn more, obviously, as we get to a hearing um, about what, what folks are asking for. There was an attempt. We also know that there's been a push to, instead of having like a <clears throat> incentive model to actually shift um, and power from a surcharge um, funding system to being rate-based, um, that's something we would certainly oppose and might actually be, would probably be something that our Maryland Perg and most of our coalition would say we're not going to support a bill if it shifts in power to a rate base because that again would allow those profits to get way higher than we think is necessary. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I I, wanna... yeah, go ahead, Ruthann. No, I just want to underscore this idea of the profit margins. We work with boards of public utilities and energy companies in Michigan and New Jersey and other places around the country. And this is an extraordinary benefit on the utility side, that if we are really going to think about equity across the frame, we have to think about that has to be addressed. And then the other thing I wanted to just say, and Rebecca, I'm sorry for jumping in, but our state is about to put in for the climate pollution reduction grants and a number of series of grants in the federal government. Having Empower pass will, in my belief, right, better equip our state agencies in capturing the maximum number of federal dollars because we've all shown our commitment to that plan to equity and others. So sorry to jump in on that. No, no, and I and I um the piece I wanted to emphasize from what Emily said is that, you know, sometimes during session, really good ideas run out of time. And this is one of those those we can't let that happen because there's it's technical. The the goals and what we want are really clear and we've been clear about it and it's clear in the climate plan. The law itself, the code, the technical fixes, it gets, I said technical already, but complicated and technical really fast. And, and we just need to make sure um, the folks folks are at the table and we can, we can get this done this year for all the reasons we've said. I know we're oof, already short on time, but um, a good question came in from the audience, which is, um, can Empower work if we continue to invest billions of dollars in new gas infrastructure through Stride? Um, and this is, so I want someone to define Stride. What's that acronym? And then um, it's a good question because um, there's another bill that you could support that um, might help offset that. So Emily, maybe I'll pass it over to you first. Yeah. So Stride is the Strategic Gas Infrastructure Investment Program that passed in 2013. It's what enables gas utilities. The push was to get gas utilities to more quickly address gas safety and pipeline replacement. It's so broad, however, that it's led to um, it being hard for the Public Service Commission to rein in that spending. There's a bill. This was there's a bill in the House and Senate HB 731 SB 548. Hearing on the Senate is next Thursday. Um, in Tripoli, that's Senator Sidnor in Baltimore County. Um, the Climate Commission, the Climate Commission at uh, Maryland statewide, as well as the Building Electrification Task Force, both recommend revisions to this program. So what the bill does, it doesn't repeal it, it says you can still doing it, but you need to make sure that you're actually prioritizing the riskiest pipes, not just replacing the whole um, system, and that you're using a cost effectiveness measure. So anyone from Baltimore City knows we had a whole drama this summer over gas regulators, internal, external, which one's more expensive, and you're just making sure that the utilities aren't just using this program to um, pad their profits. Um, and then long term, we the commission is also considering a, a future of gas proceeding to figure out what is the plan for gas, right? When Stride passed, it was before we had the climate goals. It's before we knew we were going to be switching to electric. Um, 
I'm all, I'm happy to talk a whole, whole another conversation about stride, but I'd say it, I don't think they're connected, obviously, but they're not dependent on each other um, by any means. And power could be successful if stride is still successful. Um, but we certainly need a whole statewide strategy and approach to how we're going to achieve the clean energy future we want, where our homes are healthy, clean, powered by clean energy. And part of that is what is, how are we going to strategically, you know, transition off of gas and help the families who want to, and especially help our low income families do so quickly. Um, and that's a bigger conversation, but these are all parts of it. Yeah. Thanks, Emily. And, um, we had a good question in the chat about how people can, can get engaged. Um, and so, at like this, like all bills, uh, if you go to the Maryland General Assembly webpage, you can see what date, if it's been set, that the hearing is. The hearing is set for February 29th, which I think all bills ha have a hearing on February 29th because it's our extra day. They're just, they go through, right? It's just a good, um, it's our extra day this year and we can we can leap ahead with those, um, is my theory for anyone that has a hearing on the 29th. Uh, hearings begin at 1 p.m. typically. That does not mean that the bill that you are interested in that day will be heard at 1 p.m. Um, so if you plan to come to Annapolis to testify, please bring water and a snack um, and uh, your patience. Um, and and we uh, are going to put a, a action alert in the chat and you can sign up um, to testify on the bill if you'd like or submit written testimony, in which case you're not obligated to come to Annapolis that day. Um, so there's lots of ways for you to weigh in on the bills that you care about during the legislative session. Um, true for this and, and all bills that you care about. So uh, how would you all recommend, if people are interested, two things. I want to benefit from Empower Dollars. I want to make these upgrades to my home. What do I do? That's the first question. Who wants to take it? Again, I can put a link if I can get to it quick enough. Contact your utility um, in Montgomery County. There's a separate place where you can get your own discounted or free energy audit and get access to those incentives. Um, and then Maddie could probably touch on how to get involved with our grassroots effort. We've got some rallies, lobby days coming up as well. Yeah, Ruthann. You're muted. I can't. Sorry about that. Hey, look, uh, we're going to be doing a whole series of what does electrification, decarbonization, and empower mean to me. Uh, thank you to the Environmental Protection Agency for allowing us to build the platform of education just around uh, what uh, the, all of this may mean. And um, it's not it's not promoting legislation. It's just providing education. I should say that. Uh, but we're doing a series about six or eight meetings uh, and for low income residents who attend, we're going to do a lot of training around this and they're getting mm -hmm. stipended for participating um, and learning and going through the education. So if you go to ghhi.org or I'll share with you, Rebecca, the series of trainings happening in Montgomery County, Prince George's County and Baltimore, but a lot of them will be virtual. So everybody uh, can attend and I just uh, education on all of this is so critical to building constituency that can make their own decisions about what is right for their health for their future for the climate uh, so I just wanted to add that too if I could awesome thanks for that and then the last question what is your recommendation for people to do to support this this bill it does get technical quickly if folks can't don't have capacity to get in that in the, that level of weeds. What what can we do? What what would you tell them to do? I'm going I'm to quote Sandy Rosenberg in the Rule of Seven. Right, that legislators pay attention when they get seven calls, seven emails, or seven letters, or seven people showing up in their office. So let's find seven of us at least. But um, you know, make a phone call to your to your legislator. Let them know they you live in the district that you vote. That's important. Uh, but definitely take time to send an email, to make a phone call. If you if you can't show up, uh, you can send an old fashioned letter, of course, but uh, emails and phone calls matter. Uh, talk to others in your community. If you have uh, the opportunity to write a letter to the editor, uh, do take action in any way that fits you, but take action, speak up and say something that builds a big inertia. Awesome. Awesome. And we're out of time, but I 
There's a good question in the chat that I feel like we need to clear up. What about apartment buildings? Is this for homes only or can folks uh, living and what, a, you know, living in multifamily buildings qualify for empower? Large multifamily buildings do. I don't think, and we're hoping that they more start accessing it because the Climate Solutions Now Act requires them to reduce emissions and empower funds can help them do that. Thank you so much, Emily. All right, as we wrap up, I just want to thank everyone who joined today and Ruthann and Maddie and Emily for joining us. Thanks for your insight um, and for, and we keep using this pun, but for empowering the audience to get involved. So get empowered on Empower, uh, get involved. Um, and you're going to get a survey to let us know what else you want to hear about in the, the weeks left in session. Um, stay tuned for our next Friday Digest and take an action between now and next Friday. Grab six of your friends. So seven of you show up in an office um, and let's get it done. So enjoy your weekend uh, and, and, you know, keep charging on this session. It's going to, it's a long, it's a long one. There's a lot of moving pieces, it feels like. So thank you all for your attention engagement and see you soon. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks, LCV.